Kevin there and Vicky there were acting a little, I'm going to like this, okay. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died for our sin, rose again, and was resurrected on the third day, and ascended and is seated by the Father's right hand, interceding for us? Have you accepted Christ as your personal Savior and received full pardon for your debt of sin? Are you willing to walk in the light of His Word as you are enlightened through personal study and through the instruction received from the body through the teaching and preaching of the Word? Are you willing to support this body with your time, talent, and resources as God prospers you? Do all the other members of this body promise to do all to assist these new members in their walk with Christ? Amen. Yeah. All right. Let's pray. Father, I love you, Lord. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for these beautiful people. I thank you, God, for this awesome opportunity, Lord, for them to join this fellowship, Lord. I thank you right now, Lord, for ministering to them and through them, Father. And, Lord, let this be the beginning of a wonderful, wonderful relationship, God. And we thank you, God, that we know, Lord, that no matter what, you're here with us, Lord. But this is just another step in Christian maturity, and it brings us to a, a higher level of maturity in you. And we thank you for all that you do and all that you're going to do. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for these people. Let them grow, grow, grow. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. It would be the first to offer you the right hand of fellowship as you become a faithful member of this body. Feel free to call upon the services of your pastor or whoever else in here anytime. In the name of Jesus, we love y'all. All right. Y'all come. God is awesome. Already done. You know, uh, while riding the bus, this woman noticed a young man who was holding on to the same pole, and he was staring at her. Eventually, he said, excuse me, this is my stop. She said, uh, she wasn't blocking his way, so she was confused. She said, well, she said, well, go ahead. He said, well, this is my pole, he said. My mother was, or the woman was completely perplexed, and the young man added, I just bought it at the hardware store to hold up my shower curtain. <laughs> But then he picked up his pole and carried it off on the bus. Amen. You want to have some fun? Go to the go to the airport in Atlanta and ride that whatever that thing is. That tram, that that, that, that whatever that thing is. It's like a jet. I, I forget what they call it. But you get on it. You better be holding on because when it takes off, it's like I mean it's like warp speed. I'm expecting here. I'm expecting here Captain Picard say warp speed number one. <laughs> Didn't God go? This is beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it so beautiful? Two weeks in a row. Amen. It's been absolutely beautiful. Get your Bibles out. Turn to the reading of the Word. And it's going to be in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you don't know what 1 Timothy is, it's right before 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I, I hope, I'm, well, I'm, I'm planning on this being brief today. But every time I plan on being brief, y'all wind up getting all excited. And I just get fired up. Amen. Amen. Uh, that's right. Uh, I've, been, I've been asking God to help me just get some, not just go with series, but Lord, just help me go ahead and get some, some, some little uh, uh, inspirational wonders, <laughs> one-timers, uh, one and done. Say me and y'all pray for Duke today. Uh, they, they, I don't want them to be one and done tonight. I want them to go from the Elite Eight to the Final Four. Amen. Uh, of course, if y'all aren't Luke fans, if you're Carolina fans, you got nothing to worry about anyway because they're home watching it on television. <laughs> go Steph and they start going, yeah. Amen. I want you to know I was pulling for Carolina. Amen. I just had to, I, just had to, I pulled for them longer than I pulled for Virginia. Amen. Get it? Virginia went out in the first round? Okay. How many basketball fans? College basketball fans. Okay, there's four of them. It's all right. Five. Okay. All right, here we go. That's one of my favorite sports. Fight. The good fight of faith. Get your Bibles out. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Stand for the reading of the word. I hope this is as inspirational to you as it was to me because actually it was inspirational to me and it stomped my toes at the same time. Believe me, when you're saying, man, he sure did stomp my toes. Now just remember, 
I'm wearing steel toes too, okay? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Wow, I'm going to do it again. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus already gave us eternal life, so what's he talking about? Jesus already gave it. So why are we to lay hold on eternal life? I'm going to get ready to tell you. Wherefore thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Stretch forth your hands this way. Father, we love you, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We know, God, that there's nothing impossible for you. We know, God, that everything that is said and done is said and done, Lord, for your glory and for your honor, Lord. And if it isn't, Lord, strike it. Lord, I thank you, God, that we can come together and witness the, the, the most awesome thing, and that's the church growing. We thank you, God, for last week and this week and the, the major growth. We thank you, God, that there's some other things happening. God is going to really, really just go ahead and propel us, and I believe that, Lord, and I thank you for that. I thank you mainly, Lord, for your son, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, today, Lord, we celebrate his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And, Lord, next week we're going to celebrate, uh, not necessarily uh, celebrate the agony of him on the cross, but celebrate the resurrection from the dead. We thank you for that too, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that he was willing to take that cross, fight that good fight of faith. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we love you. We praise you. Amen. The church said? Amen. On the way down, tell somebody, if you're not here after, you'll be here after. If you're not here after what I'm here after, you'll be here after I'm gone. If you're not here after, Please remember Barbara and Benny, uh, their granddaughter died. She's being buried today. Was it yesterday? The person told me yesterday, they didn't tell me today. So was it yesterday? Today. Today. Four o'clock, they're having a memorial service. Four, four o'clock today, the memorial service. And anybody who wants cards, to send cards, or just have a go to the door, they can come and get your card. Right. Uh, I've got the address to be sent out this morning. Okay. So please remember that. Uh, it's not fun to be hit below the belt by any of this stuff. You know, we got hit below the belt a couple weeks ago with Bethany, and uh, bless her heart, she'd been hurting really, really bad, and the doctor finally gave her some good medicine, and that's helped her a lot, but tomorrow she goes to the cancer clinic, and we'll find out more what's going on. But please be praying for Bethany also. She's the same age as being his granddaughter, 26, and as you know, Bethany has malignant melanoma, and she has it in at least one place, and there may be others, so let's please remember her in a lymph node, and it's three by three, maybe a little bit bigger now. But remember her in prayer also, because she's going to fight the good fight of faith. Tell them about the ten word prayer, Bethany. Can you say it? Say it for me. I'll, I'll repeat it out so you ain't got to be so loud. Say it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All right. Amen. That's that ten word prayer. Amen. 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 So now we're going to talk about fighting the good fight. Of faith. Now, I could have gone through this and done the exegesis, and, and actually, I was really, I was really uh, debating on how deep to take this because I really wanted to take it really, really deep and take three or four weeks and really just take one day and talk about fight, and one day talk about the good fight, and the next day talk about the good fight of faith. You know, the next week, and 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 and, all, and then yesterday I was at uh, an Emmaus meeting, and while I was at the Emmaus meeting, the, the, the for the for the upcoming walk, the 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 the. the uh, uh, Lead director said that he was uh, the, the, he said that he was actually uh, praying to God to find out what he was going to be doing as he led this walk. And he said the Lord spoke to him very simply and said, "Kiss." And you expect something very sweet from that kiss. He said, "Yeah, keep it simple, stupid." He said, "All right, Lord, I got that." And so I listened to him talk about keep it simple, keep it simple, keep it simple. So I came home and I said, you know what? We're going to do this simple, just as simple as possible. Fight the good fight of faith. Y'all read this with me. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on the eternal life to which you were called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Wow. That, that's a very powerful, powerful thing. How many knows what today is? Today is actually... Uh, Palm Sunday. Now, because it's Palm Sunday, for those that don't realize or maybe haven't thought about it, that Palm Sunday actually
obviously, uh, uh, of course, this is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is, this was a day of celebration. The reason it was a day of celebration is because they thought Jesus was coming in and Jesus was going to take over for them and Jesus was going to, going to rule and reign over the Romans. But see, they celebrated, but that celebration was short-lived because in just a few days, the same people that were crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, make him king, make him king, the same group was now crying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. As a matter of fact, this, this day actually was the beginning of the Passion. And, and I want you to think about something now. If there was going to be any turning back, any turning back, it needed to be then. As he's coming in, it should have been now instead of later. But I love this because this is how this all fit all together for me when I was looking at this message. Is Jesus fought the good fight of faith. And not he fight the good fight of faith, but he laid hold on eternal life for all of us. Because of what he did in this week coming up, all, all his whole life, but especially in this Passion Week. From the beginning to the end. From the time he rode in, to the time he was taken out, to the time he rose, or uh, was put on the cross, to the time that he was played in the tomb and rose from the dead. All that was part of God's plan. And he, Jesus, laid hold on eternal life. Somebody give the Lord a hand for that. And thank him for that. Amen. He laid hold on eternal life for all of us. So now let's just go a little bit further here. Let's take a little bit deeper now. Let us look at the scripture here. I love the scripture because the scripture uh, is very strong. It says, fight the good fight of faith. In other words, get on the offense. Don't sit on the fence. Get on the offense. Amen? You know, a lot of us live on the defense. What's the difference in defense and offense? Watch a football game. Who has the ball? The offense or the defense? The offense. The offense. Who's the one that's supposed to be carrying the ball all the way to the goal line? The offense or the defense? The offense. Who are the ones that are trying to stop the offense from scoring? The defense. That's right. And so we should be with the ball in our hand, and we should be taking control of the game through the Lord Jesus Christ, through His power and through His authority. We're supposed to be carrying the ball. We're supposed to be getting it done for God. But a lot of times, instead of us getting it done for God, and the enemy comes against us, we're too busy on the defense. We're just trying to keep him from running over us. He's got the ball, and he's running over us. You know, a high-scoring game, what did it say? But it was a high-scoring game. Well, the defense was not in good shape today. Think about it. If you're watching a football game, a basketball game, if you see a high-scoring basketball game, if that it was a very high-scoring bat, uh, scoring game, they say the offense was good, but the defense wasn't doing so hot today. Amen. So, so if you're having Satan score a lot of scores against you, listen carefully. Not just because of the NCAA, or NCAA tournament, which I do adore, and not just because of that, but period. If the enemy is racking up points on you constantly then it could be that it's an offensive game, Satan's in control of the ball, and you're not doing a very good job of your defense, and he's just racking up, racking up, racking up, racking up. And because of that, Satan is winning in your battle. Now, now, now remember, you, you, you don't have to raise your hand, you don't have to point anybody, I just want you to think of your own life. Is Satan racking up the points against you? If he is, then your defense is weak. Matter of fact, you're not only listen, not only is your defense weak, you're not even you don't even have an offense. It's important that we rack up points against him. And if we're racking up points against him, we have a strong offense and we come against his defense. So now, so, so first, get on the offense. Fight the enemy. Matter of fact, you know, now is the time not to be passive. There's a lot of people I know by nature, they're passive. You know, uh, believe it or not, there's times where I'm passive. When it comes to God's work, when it comes to getting it done, when it comes to knowing that, uh, that His offense is coming against me and I need to put up a good defense, then I'm no longer passive. I do my best to take the ball out of His hand and put my offense on the field with God's help, not by myself, with God's help, put the offense on the field and run the ball the other way and start racking up points against Him versus Him racking up points against me. So 
in this fight, you cannot be passive. And again, if you want another opinion, if you want to know if you're winning or losing this fight, just think about it. Just think about it. Are the points coming against you or are you putting up the points against him? That's so simple. That's as plain as the nose on your face. You know. Nobody has to tell you if you're getting whooped. A lot of times we were getting whipped at halftime. We come in at like 40, 40 to 20. And we come in and said, what's happening, coach? And I said, you're getting whipped. They said, we know that. I said, obviously you don't. You got the plays. You know how to play it. Why aren't you playing the plays? I'm out here straight. He's showing you how to play the plays. I'm telling you, but you won't play. You're being too passive. And I watched him come back and beat them by 40 points. Once they got in the game and got their game going instead of playing theirs. You know, John Wooden, he used to say this. John Wooden wouldn't even go out and scout the other team. They said, why don't you scout the other team, John? He won 88 straight games. 88 straight NCAA games. Can you imagine winning 88 straight games? He won 88 straight games with seven national championships in a row. And he didn't scout the other team. You know why he didn't scout the other team? He said, because they're going to play our game. And constantly, when he got the team on the floor, the other team come up, well, no matter what they tried, he kept playing his game. And as he played his game, his game could tear up the other team hands down, and it was proven 88 times in a row. I'm here to tell you right now, we've got a proven track record. Our God wins. Our God has the battle plan. Our God has the power. Our God
It says, be careful now. I want you to watch this. It's so, 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 so awesome. It says, watch this now. Here it goes. Be angry and do not sin. Be angry. Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Wait a minute. It just said be angry, but this says no wrath. But here's the difference. Lord, give place to the devil. And then I went ahead and took the message and showed it. Go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry. Anger in itself <clears throat> prompts you into warfare. Anger. When, 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 <clears throat> like all these kids that are marching to Washington, D.C., all these kids are doing this marching and stuff, they're, they're angry. And, and, and they're trying to do something about it. They're trying to their voices be heard. And it's because they're angry because of school shootings. I, 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 I get angry too. I just think that they're going about it in some, some of the right ways and some of the wrong ways. Yes, they need to have better legislation for gun control. Yes. But it's one thing they're leaving out, and that is the mental health issue. Because if you take all the guns and lock them up, number one, the guns will still be here. They're already going to be here. Anyway. And number two, if you took every gun and put it in the ocean, every gun that belonged to everybody, still, if they wanted to kill you, they'll find a way to kill you. Amen? I, I've, never, uh, I, I've never seen a gun chop off the shelf and shoot somebody. Somebody had to be in control of them. Amen? The same way. You're going to blame a car for somebody getting a DWI? No, you're going to blame the driver. The same way. With the school shootings, we need to have a better mental health system. And the way it crazies the world's getting right now, and not just school shootings, all kinds of shootings going on. Every last one of them had two things going on wrong with them. They had a mental problem and they had a spiritual problem. And you notice the two things they don't talk about? I talk about the gun, 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 gun. Well, how about talking about spiritual and mental problems? That's the two things you need to hit really, really hard. So, so here we go. Go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry, but do not use your anger as fuel for revenge. And don't stay angry. <clears throat> don't go to being angry. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold uh, in your life. So let me just show you this now. This, this right here really... <clears throat> Anger is one thing. Anger moves me. Anger prompts me. Anger actually gets your adrenaline flowing to the point that you get up and do something. So, so it makes me angry when kids go to bed hungry because their parents are out drinking all night and then, then spend all their money they can't afford to take care of the kids. It made me angry to see that woman taking that pot and putting it to that baby's mouth. Y'all see that? It made me angry. I mean angry. Okay? But again, again, Anger is healthy. Anger will get you, put you in the right mode to get you to do something. Amen? It will, get, again, get your adrenaline glands going, and, and, and it will get you moving. Watch this. Once your anger gets out of control, it's wrath. Now, has anybody here ever lost their temper? You ain't got to raise your hand. I see some of your spouses looking at you. Matter of fact, if they had ray gun eyes, y'all would already be dead. Your head would just explode like on Raiders of the Lost Ark. <clears throat> to lose your temper, to lose control, it's at this point you break things. It's at this point you hurt things. It's at this point that people really, really get hurt. And God doesn't want his people at the point where they have no control. Because if you have no control, then he can't use you. Listen carefully. If you're angry, he can use you because now he can, he can get you in a mode to do something. Your adrenaline glands are flowing, but once you lose your temper, your, your frontal lobe quits working. You quit, you've lost control. Now it's all being controlled in the back, and now all of a sudden you've lost all your all, all wits, and you're doing something stupid. Now you're being driven by this, this wrath. And so God says, be angry and sin not mean to let your anger cause you to do something that's against God's word, not to miss the mark. But at the same time, if you lose your cool, all then you're going to lose the ability to think. And when you lose the ability to think, then all of a sudden you start doing things and saying things that are not like you. You start acting out things that, matter of fact, whatever you used to, used to do, that's what you're going to go back to because it's stored in your mind. It's, Here it goes. Got a big problem. If you're going to be angry with wrath with your spouse, you'll wake up madder in the morning than you were when you went to bed with them. Because as you go to bed, Satan says, do not open the door to Satan. Once you get angry, it's one thing. That's God's weapon. But once it becomes wrath, it's a door to Satan. Then Satan can take that wrath and talk to you all night long about how bad your spouse is. You married the wrong one. Blah, blah, blah. Your mama told you. Your daddy told you. You didn't listen. And when you get up in the morning, you're madder at him than you were to start with. Same way with friends. Same way with unresolved conflicts. Here, here's, here's what I'm talking about. 
close the doors of opportunity for Satan. Watch this. <clears throat> it's a downward spiral. I love this. I saw this t-shirt. Why are y'all trying to test the Jesus in me? Anybody ever had that feeling? Why, why are you trying to test the Jesus in me? I'm getting ready to hurt you. <clears throat> yeah, I've, heard, I've heard Christians say, I'm getting ready to lay that cross down. Yeah, I'm going to lay it down on top of you. Strong and hard. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so, so, so watch this. <clears throat> this is the progression that happens. All right? Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, once you open that door of opportunity, uh, uh, and it wreaks havoc in your life, first, here, here watch this. <clears throat> Unprocessed anger. It just builds up, it builds up, it builds up until I explode. That's what happens. A lot of times wrath comes from unprocessed anger. You're not handling it correctly. You're not just trying to do something about it. You're not trying to, to handle it in such a way you just keep pushing it down, pushing it down, pushing it down, and one day it pops up. I may have heard somebody say, we don't understand why that guy did that because he's always been such a good guy. We never had a problem with him. And all of a sudden, they popped his cork. You know why? He had unprocessed anger. You've got to learn how to handle anger. Give it to God and let God help you be fruitful with that anger before you hurt somebody. So then, yeah, once that anger is unprocessed, it leads to unconfessed sin because now you've got all kinds of thoughts going in your head and you've got all kinds of things you're going to do and maybe even do. Maybe even lose your cool and there's some things you've done that you wish you hadn't have done. How many ever got angry and done something you wish you hadn't done? Everybody can raise your hand. It's okay. Now look around. So everybody, everybody raise your hand. Everybody. <clears throat> All right, there you go. That's good. I want everybody to see that. So you don't think you're the Lone Ranger in here. <laughs> Amen. So, so, <clears throat> so then there's an unconfessed, unconfessed sin. Then unconfessed sin winds up leading to unforgiveness and to grudges. Why? Wow. Who wants to live in unforgiveness in your life and grudges? Amen. Or uh, a resentment in grudges. Either way, there's grudges in here. Unforgiveness is when, is when uh, uh, you've done something to me and I'm not going to forgive you for it and I hold a grudge against you. I'm holding that unforgiveness in place. I'm propping that unforgiveness up. I refuse to forgive you until I'm sure you've paid the right price for me to forgive you. The problem is none of us have the right price to pay to get out of somebody to get up receive unforgiveness or to get forgiveness. You have to, it has to be an act, a willful act of a God pay to forgive. Number two, maybe maybe I've done something or you've done something to me and now I'm just resentful. I'm just resentful towards you. Usually uh, uh, when somebody's unforgiven, there's a lot of times it can be passive, but when they're resentful, it's usually not passive. Not passive. It can even be combative, but now you're resentful. And again, here goes the grudge. You're propping it up. You're not going to let them out. You're not letting them get a break. Amen? <clears throat> But God tells us to shut the door on anything in our life or that, that opens the door for a spiritual attack. Remember that. So first, you've got to fight. Get on the offense. <clears throat> Secondly, you've got to close doors of opportunity <coughs> for Satan. And then watch this. Look. And number three, you've got to remember the reason you're even doing this to start with. If you stand for a reason, be prepared to stand alone like a tree. If you fall on the ground, fall like a seed that grows back to fight again. Wow. You may not be down, but I'm coming back. Life may not be down, but I'm coming back. I'm not just going to lay here and die. I'm going to do something. Amen? So, so, so remember, watch this. I, I, love, I, I love what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. He said, therefore, I do not run with, without a definite goal. I do not flail around like one beating the air just shadow boxing. I know what I'm doing this for. Lay hold on eternal life. <clears throat> Lay hold on it. Remember, eternal life is free. But the fight is real and it's costly. Because remember, Satan wants to steal your eternal life. Satan wants to steal your joy. Satan wants to steal your victory. He wants to steal your ability to stand strong and, and, and combat him. <clears throat> remember, if, you are, if you've got a lot of points stacking up against you, remember what's going on. Your defense has gotten weak. And Satan is running over you. You need to have more wins than you do losses. Well, right, you watch a coach that has more wins than losses. What's he called? A winning coach. If he wins, wins more than they lose in the season, what's it called? A winning season. 
I want winning seasons. I want to be a winning coach. How about you? Amen? So, so, <clears throat> so get ready to hear this. I love this. I'm just going to say this real quick, and then I'm going to let you come here and pray. Oop, there you go. Fly away there, buddy. Fight the good fight of faith. Now, 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 here we go. Listen to this. This is going to be, this is really awesome. Uh, uh, just some things that you should never say. How many want to see some things that you should never say? Now, before you, before you start saying, well, that's easy for him to say, just remember, when I wrote this, I did like this. Ouch! Ow! I think I'll put this one out, and I'm going to put it back in. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, Lord. And so, remember, before they prick your toes, they stomp mine. Ready? <clears throat> Number one thing, I'm going to watch this. Here's things that winners never say. Ready? Watch this. Oh, excuse me. I forgot. I uh, forgot about this. Uh, maintain a proper attitude. I forgot that. You're also called to confess the good fashion in the presence of many enemies. Watch this. The, the way that we communicate, the way that we run our mouth, our mouth, the Bible says that we are, we are condemned by our words, we are given power by our words, life and death are in the power of the lot. The tongue is the smallest of, or the, or the rudder is the smallest of vessels, but it turns a mighty ship. So, so the way we communicate has a great deal to do with our level of success. So watch this. We can talk ourselves into or out of success. Not only can we talk each other, our, ourselves into or out of success, but you know we can talk others into or out of success by our mouth. I want you to think about this. <clears throat> you're having a bad day. You're having a bad time. You lose your cool. You say things you didn't really mean, but you said them and you meant them at the time, but you don't mean them anymore. But there were certain people that were around you that were already struggling, and they didn't tell you they were struggling. They were already having problems, but you didn't know they were having problems. And they were about ready to quit anyway, and they get around you who they consider to be a spiritual giant. And now you're losing your cool, and you said things you shouldn't have and done things you shouldn't have. And then when they see you and hear you, all of a sudden now, they decide they're going to quit the fight too. And you actually want to climb back in and wonder where they went. <laughs> it's because Satan used your... to tear up somebody else. And you never even talked to them. Why? You didn't call them a name. You didn't, you didn't do anything to them, but they heard you <clears throat> and watched how you acted, and then it pushed them to the side. So here we go. Here it is. Five things. Winners never say, I can't. <clears throat> I got to clear my throat. Matter of fact, I may have to clear more of my throat before I get through. I can't. Scripture says, watch this, I love this, I can do all things which he has called me to do through him who strengthens and empowers me to inward prayer to fulfill his purpose. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses me with inner strength and confident peace. Philippians 4.13, that's the Amplified Version. Next time you're tempted to say, I can't, before you say, I can't, have confidence in God and His power to see you through it. Matter of fact, and Bethany and I are doing this now, and, and, and her mom, all three of us, we're doing this now. The little ten word prayer we're saying, every day we're saying it all the time. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Make this your new verse of affirmation. Quit saying, I can't. Now, without raising a hand, Without pointing, just think about it. How often in a day do you say, I can't? Mm. Mm. If you can take that I can't and turn it into an I can through Christ who strengthens me, your life will turn around that day. All right? Number one, winners never say, I can't. Number two, I love that. Who knows who that is? Who knows who that is? Yoda. 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 <laughs> <laughs> who can talk like him? He 
DC. DC can talk like him. Say that, DC. Talk like Yoda. No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Skywalker was going to try, and he said no. So you know what this is going, don't you? Look, winners never say, what's this? Look, I'll try. I love this scripture. I'm trying to give you a scripture in a whole different way of looking at it. It's actually crazy. Watch this. Have you not known, have you not heard that everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not faint or grow weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He is power to the faint and weary. And to him who has no might, he increases strength, causing it to multiply and making it abound. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. That word faint means quit. To give out to the point where you quit. And be weary. Not only are you going to quit, you feel so bad you're not even going to try again. And the young men shall feebly stumble and fall exhausted. But those who wait on the Lord, who expect for, look for, and hope in Him shall change and renew their strength and power. They shall lift up their wings and mount up close to God as eagles up to the sun. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint, quit, or become tired. So watch this. Look, look. I know this is hard because I'll say this too just so I don't have to make a promise that I can't keep. I'll say I'll try. That's what I always say to say, well, can you promise me? Well, I'll try. I promise I'll try. You know, let me tell you something. Now, tell you, this hurt. Now, I, I sit here right here and I was working this sermon and tomorrow I'm this sermon the wall and throw it away. Winners. Words that winners never say is I can't and I'll try. Matter of fact, once you try this, still saying I'll try, next time say I'll give it all I got. How's that sound? Yeah, just do it. That's a good one too. Just do it. Instead of, instead of, instead of I'll try, I'll give it all I got. Because you know what? If I try means, well, if I didn't feel like trying hard that day, I don't have to give it all I got anyway. I'll give it all I got. So now, let's go to the next word. Y'all you in this good stuff? Y'all help me out here. Is this good stuff? Yes. yes. All right, the louder y'all get, the faster I'll go. Yes. yes. All right. <laughs> Hurry up. Hurry <laughs> up. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> here we go. Enjoy life today because yesterday's gone and tomorrow's never promised. So I see this. Winners never say, I can't. They never say, uh, I'll try. And here's another one. Not unless it's scheduled. I'll do it tomorrow. I mean, if some things are scheduled for tomorrow. You can't fix something at your job today if it's not open today. I'm not talking about that. Be realistic. But here's one of my biggest ones. This hit me so hard. I got look. I had to catch my breath. I had to walk around a little bit and drink a cup of coffee. I'll do it tomorrow. If tomorrow never comes and it won't, you know. Uh, there's today and tomorrow and yesterday. Yesterday, I look back at what I did do and could have done and should have done. Today, I look at what I can do and what I'm not going to do. Tomorrow, I'm going to look at what I think I'm going to do. But obviously, when I was at Proctor again, well, back when we had iPads and all this stuff, how many of you remember little things called daytimers? I walked around with a daytimer in my pocket. And back then, I could see really good. And so I could write, I could write really cool on one line, I could put two or three lines of writing on one little line. And so, I'd write down the stuff I had to do that was just to do, and then I'd put a check by the stuff that had to be done uh, good, that had to be done uh, pretty soon, and then I would put an uh, underline what had to be done today. And the next day when I went to the team meeting, I would go through and I would transfer the list. And the ones that just had to just get done were right there, the ones that had to check and be done soon, these are right there. And the ones that had to be done today, yesterday, were put on today because something would happen. 
They would pull me from whatever I was doing, and I wouldn't even work on the list at all because I had to go work on another problem or I had another, another, another fire to put out, and so I never could get back to us. That list kept getting longer and longer and longer. So that, well, how many here, if you think about it, here I'll do it tomorrow, this keeps getting longer. Yeah. You see, so, so winners don't say I'll do it tomorrow. No matter of fact, the Bible says in Matthew 6, 34, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for itself. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. I remember somebody sending me a text this morning and said, I wish you would have tried that video yesterday so I could have fixed it. This is son, why don't you just go ahead and pop it right in the mouth while I'm working on the sermon? <laughs> I mean, after that, I started taking this and just tear it out my mouth. I said, my son, just sit right here and pop it right square in the mouth. I'm looking at the sermon. I'm going over the sermon. I'm going over the sermon, and I already told him that I can't get the video to play. And I get to the part about I'll do it tomorrow, and he wrote back. He didn't know I was looking at that. And <laughs> he says, why didn't you try it yesterday so I could have fixed it? Gloom be spared and agony on me. <laughs> so we all get it. We all, we all get hit with it. Amen. I'm telling you, I'm confessing. I got hit. I mean, I fought the law and the law won. Amen. The law, uh, uh, Murphy's law. I fought the law and the law won. All right. Watch this. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Matthew 6, 34, the message. In other words, when we invite trouble. How many ever invited trouble? Invited. Because we were expecting it to happen anyway. So we went ahead and, 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 and we did that. We, we just invited the trouble anyway. Amen. You know, uh, 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 again, I can't. I'll try. I'll do it tomorrow. You know, I can't think about <clears throat> uh, Thomas Edison. You know, Thomas Edison didn't necessarily invent the light bulb. He invented the light bulb that worked. Like the Wright brothers, their plane, they, they didn't really invent the plane. They invented the science of flight. Did y'all know that? They invented the science of flight. The same way Thomas Edison, they were trying to make light bulbs, but they couldn't make one that would last. And so his deal was the way he made his incandescent bulb last. It was he, he had to make a filament that would handle the electricity and would burn for more than, 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 than two or three minutes or two or three seconds or however long they would get them to run. And so do you know how many, of course, they say it could be more, it could be less, but the average, they, if you look it up, the average, some say it's 3,500, whatever. But you know what the average thing says, how many different filaments he tried before he found the right filament to work in the light bulb. Guess how many? 9,000. No, excuse me. It was actually 10,000. It was 10,000 tries to find the right filament. Somebody asked me, said, what was that? You, 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 you failed 9,999 times? He said, no, I didn't fail. He said, I just found 9,999 things that wouldn't work. Matter of fact, his, 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 he had his experiments going on in his great big warehouse. And his warehouse we caught on fire and it was burning down. And he had all these costly experiments going on in there with the phonograph and, and all the tape and the recorders and all this stuff was in there. And he had all this stuff going on and it was burning down. And he stood beside it or stood out there away from it and was watching it burn. And somebody looked at him and said, I'm so sorry, Mr. Edison, what do you want me to do? It's recorded. He said, go get my wife. So she ain't never seen a fire like this. <laughs> and then they say, well, you're losing it all. He said, it's just a better chance for me to start tomorrow. Wow. And that man's credited with doing a whole lot of things. But he didn't say, I can't. I'll try and I'll do it tomorrow. Amen. I'm getting ready. I'm just about closed. Somebody say amen. <clears throat> How many was that? One. Two, three. Eight. So there's two more, right? Okay. So I was having a little problem. You ready? I love this. There's a difference in us waiting on God and God waiting on us. Wow. You ready? In the middle of every difficulty, 
realize opportunity. That was Einstein. Matter of fact, do you know that most <clears throat> of our greatest inventions came from accidents and problems? So here we go. Here's some winners never say. First is don't say I can. I'll try to do more. Or I have a problem. Don't just say that I had a problem. You hear me? <clears throat> I did it on purpose. <clears throat> I have a problem. Now, you'd be a silly man not to admit that you have a problem. Those here say admit the problem first thing and, and fixing it. Well, how about this though? How about the way you say it? Let's say I've got a problem. I've got it in the negative. I got a problem. I got the 999 <clears throat> filaments that don't work. So try this tomorrow. Try it today. Instead of saying I have a problem, try saying I have an opportunity. You see, again, Joseph replied, do not, do not be afraid. Do not act, do, do I act for God? <clears throat> <coughs> Don't you see you plan evil against me, but God used those same plans for my good. As you see all around you right now, life for many people, easy now. You have nothing to fear. I'll take care of you and your children. He reassured and speak of them from the heart. In other words, what you meant for my bad, God used for your good. The man was in prison for 10 years in shackles. It was bad for a crime he did not commit. And it all started because his brothers tried to kill him and they put him in a pit, sold him as a slave. And in slavery, that's when all this, all this started happening. And he's in the prison after seven plus years. Uh, uh, the butler says, I'm going to go tell, tell Ferris that he'll let you go. And he forgot two more years. <clears throat> so here it is, ten plus years in prison. Forgotten. And he says... Y'all guys don't be upset with yourself. Y'all meant it for my bad. But God used it for my good and your good. You see, <clears throat> let God turn your stumbling blocks into stepping stones. Here's the last one. <clears throat> this one here, I had to really, really work with the family. I work with all these words of family all the time because I was the great action man. I took care of all the problems. And so I would tell people, quit telling me you're going to try, I need you to do this. You know, quit telling me, or they would tell me, uh, the big weeks would come to me and say, we don't look, they try, 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 we don't want to try. We need it fixed. Okay? We need it fixed, David. Forget try, fix it. Bill Shabbat would come to me all the time, fix it, David, fix it. That's his favorite word to say, fix it, David, fix it, fix it, fix it. And then somebody go to him, one of the other big ways, he said, they'll say, uh, <clears throat> have you got a fix yet? He said, David has. So there was no try, there was fix. <laughs> Amen. Alright, so here we go. Here's the last one. It's not my fault I never learned to accept responsibility. I have yet to see a time like we live in today. You want to have, you want to really get disgusted and even have a little joke? Go into a domestic courtroom and listen to them talk about the excuses of why they do the things they do. I broke into the house because my mom and daddy didn't give me the right kind of diapers when I was young. Well, I don't do good in school because my mom and daddy, they never let me have a pacifier when I was younger. Did you not? Some of the things I hear just absolutely boggles my mind. I remember that day that the woman would come up and she said, I told the judge, I want you to take my young one. He said, Why? I said, I can't do anything with her. She's 15 years old. I can't do anything with her. I want you to take her. And the judge said, I got a better thing. You take her. Tell him, if she does anything else, you'll pull her time. I don't want to go and say, Get some judge! <laughs> So watch this. Watch, watch. Here we go. Here it is. I can. I can. I can do all things. I'll try no. I shall work and not be weary. I'll do it tomorrow no. I'm going to redeem the time. I'm going to do what I can today and what has to be done tomorrow I'll do tomorrow. I have a problem no, I have an opportunity. And then it's not 
my fault. If you want to be a winner, <clears throat> we say it's not my fault. <clears throat> when I first went to Fountain and started going through problems, I heard that more than anything. I heard that a hundred times a day. Well, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. And I tell this, I'm not here to place blame. I'm here to try to find where the problem lies. If you will help me, we will fix it. They won't have this problem again. And it took a couple of months for people to understand I wasn't there trying to get their job. I was there trying to save their job. And finally, they quit saying it's not my fault. The new guys will, but the older guys quit saying it's not my fault. It's not my fault that the well was bad. It's not my fault that, that the pest class didn't hold up. It's not my fault that, 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 that there was crazy. It's not my fault, blah, blah, blah. It's not my fault the motor work. Blah, blah, it's not my fault. And I go, please, <clears throat> I'm not here to blame you. I'm trying to find a way to fix it so it doesn't happen again. It's not my fault. You know, I'm going to challenge you. Here's the challenge. If you have an opportunity to arise, not a problem, an opportunity, and you know <clears throat> that you did not start it, you know that you didn't do it, you know that, instead of saying it's not my fault, how about ask yourself this? What part did I play in this problem? What part did I play in this opportunity that's arising? What problem, what, what part did I have in it? And not necessarily just say what problem, what part did I have in the opportunity? You can say, well, what part do I have in making it better? Instead of saying it's not my fault, there's this one lady, she was from Haiti, she kept going, not my yacht man. I would tell her, so we need to get this done. She goes, not my yacht man. And I said, well, how about let's get this done? She goes, not my yacht man. She said, not my yacht man so much that I got to be a joke. And I get around and tell people, not my yacht man. Not my yacht. Not my yacht. And there's still people today don't see me. They're walking through me and go, not my yacht man. It's not my fault. Quit saying it's not my fault and say, God, what can I do to make it better? Because every last one of us, if it's a problem and you're introduced to it, you have God, if God introduces you to a problem, which we're now going to call an opportunity, guess what? If He introduces you into this thing, then you've got a part to play in it, making it better. Everybody can make it better. Amen? So watch this. Winners assume responsibility and they don't blame others. Now, I remember that day. I think I told y'all this recently. I was telling somebody this, how, that we had a. Uh, 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 the famous single fast. I'm walking through and all of a sudden I start thinking, and I looked over at one of the guys and said, that ain't good. He said, no, that's not good. I said, we just single fast. He said, yeah, we did. I said, somebody needs to fix that. He says, yeah, they do. And so I took my book. I couldn't do anything. So I took my book. Now I was walking in my office to behave myself. Just kind of hide. And I grab a book and say, I get some work done now while I'm fixing the single face. And I'm walking along, the CEO comes up and he sees me and he says, Hey, David. I said, Hey, I, said, I think we just single face. Jack Clark said, We did. I said, What you going to do? He says, No, my question is, What you going to do? I said, There I was, the next four hours taking care of single face. You see, he watched and knew that I wouldn't place blame and that I would assume responsibility. And so he would just take it on, just go ahead, you fix it, you take care of it. You see, here's a challenge. Tomorrow, I want you to take charge of your attitudes. I want you to take charge of your outlook values, take charge of your beliefs, take charge of your behavior. Winning or fighting the good fight of faith. <coughs> Laying hold of eternal life is, is not a matter of, of uh, choice. Not, not chance, but it's a matter of choice. Not chance, but choice. And watch this. You heard me say, Lord, put the heavenly duct tape on my mouth. There it is. Lord, set a guard.
or set a guard, O oh Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips to keep me from speaking thoughtlessly. God, I need some heavenly duct tape. I know that y'all do. Hmm. But I do. Fight that good fight of faith. This is going up here. Next week is Easter. We're celebrating Jesus. What he did for us at the cross. Taking our sins. Taking us. Taking our <clears throat> faults. Our attitudes. Our sin. Nailing them to the tree. Taking it for us. Dying in our place. Being buried in a tomb and rising on the third day. Good fight of faith while he was on this earth, and he fights it now. He laid hold of eternal life for all of us. And now it's important that we lay hold of it now because the enemy is fighting stronger than ever. You see the school shootings, workplace shootings, shootings in concerts, people being blown up, all these packages <clears throat> in Texas blowing up and killing people.
Thank you, Lord. We're winners, Lord. We're winners. We're not losers. We're winners. We're winners. We thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, that we're winners, not losers. That we're winning this battle. We don't have to lose it. We can win it. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We take responsibility. We want to jump in and make a difference. In the name of Jesus. 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 Thank you, Father. Glory to the Lamb of God. Glory to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Glory to the Lamb of God. Glory to the Lamb of God. God's doing something amongst us, church. Be ready. Look at somebody and say, be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Because for such a time as this, you're here. If God can take look, and they said, here are those that turn the world upside down. You know what he was talking about? And they heard him say, here they are that turn the world upside down. And he was talking about two men. Paul the signs. Two men. They said, turn the world upside down. If two men can turn the world upside down, what can we do in Edward? What can we do in Aurora? What can we do in Over County? What can we do in Pamco County? What can we do? If two men can turn the world upside down. Wow. And one man saved the entire world. Wow. God's got this. Look at what I say. God's got it. God's got it. God's got it. Amen. Come back. Listen. If I call you, matter of fact, I'd like to, to, if I could, just for a few minutes, if you would be willing. And again, I'm still, I know it's one of those things you say, why do you wait the last minute? This time I can say, look, I'm not going to say it's not my fault. And I'm not going to say wait until tomorrow. I'm not going to say let's try or I can't. I'm just going to say I kept praying and praying and praying. And it was actually last week when the Lord actually just laid something in my heart last week. So, there it is. <laughs> it was last week. And so, it's going to be different. Very different. And, and uh, probably something I'm pretty sure if I hope it comes next week, never experienced anything like this. So, so we want to get as many people as we can here next week. It's going to be awesome. Amen. It's only going to take a little bit, just a little bit of guys with, with uh, uh, some drama, just a little bit, just maybe three guys. The rest of the guys and gals we the ones that are going to help out everywhere else. And you don't have to dress up or anything, just a couple. I mean, uh, we've already got one volunteer. Uh, uh, Brandon's already volunteered. <laughs> Brandon said he was volunteered. Yeah, Brandon was volunteered. And I think uh, DC and Jordan volunteered. <laughs> uh, and and, and, and uh, there is some guys, though. There is some guys and gals. Uh, and, and I have to explain it, but it doesn't take, it's not going to take a whole lot of people. It's just going to take, I would say, a, a good uh, maybe uh, five five to maybe eight people to do this because this is going to be out of left field somewhere and people are not going to see it coming and I want it to be that way, it wouldn't be like a regular Sunday morning service and it's going to come out of left field and that's the way I just, that's why I just felt the Lord showed me and so it's going to be out of left field and so that's why it's not going to be a whole lot of people uh, but please get all your friends, your family here, especially those that are struggling, get them here because I believe they will get something that they may not have gotten recently and or ever before. Amen. And Tuesday night, come on Tuesday night, we're having a good time talking about our purpose. Our purpose in God. And the last couple of Tuesday nights has been really, really powerful and really, really enlightening. Because uh, we start to study church history and see what some other guys said and done along the way. You'll be fascinated and amazed at, 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 at history. Amen. Just amazing. Brother Baker,
I love doing that. <laughs> I won't sell a light in the bank, but that ain't going to work either. All right, the bearded baker, that ain't going to work either. How about the, all right, the elder baker, the statesman? There you go. He just miss us in prayer, please. <laughs> 